The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Shreelas will be getting all of this media from these people. So that's going to be much higher quality that we can upload. Yeah, yeah. I don't know what they're going to do with it, though. So. They're going to put together a... I think they're gonna like cut and paste and stuff. They are, yeah, so. but I think they're also giving us the raw, the oh, actual the full okay. recordings as well. Okay. Cool. At least that's what I mentioned to Sophie when we talked about it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> from Anglia Western University, Jack, waiting at the back and Barbara, waiting at the front here, who met briefly yesterday. Um, I hope to do that. So please, could anyone give any questions to me if they've got any questions to do in the film or doing the film, that would be great. Um, if you don't object, I'm going to assume that we should be doing the film. Um, uh, as you know, you signed up for breakout sessions. I think everyone signed up for the remote sensing ones at least, but they haven't so far for this introduction. Um, I'm not a gentleman to my left, uh, so good that you've done that. If you haven't signed up for all the ones, please make sure. Uh, you might have noticed in your conference bag that there are wide ones for you. You can notice that, give us a wave or a nod. So you do have access to the internet uh, free while you're here, um, so do make use of those. Uh, again, you'll have noticed on the desk there's a polar banquet time and sign up sheet. Um, which we're going to uh, just make sure is accurate. Today's going to give accurate information to the uh, kitchen. So if you suddenly think you want to come and you haven't signed up, please do sign up for that. Uh, we'll work out where you came at some point today. <laughs> um, also, room is only on the table outside um, the door, just inside the entrance door, is the filler, the filler auction that Pia is organising. The idea is we're uh, Arranging a set of objects on the table, they will have a piece of white paper underneath them or on them, and you are free to bid whatever price you would like um, to to have that object. You may be outbid uh, if someone really wants the object but more than you. So the object of that, that exercise is to outbid if you someone's already bid one pence. You know you can bid two p. And by the way, in English money, that's not very much. Um, <laughs> uh, and what are the other notices? Um, at some point, we'll also have the menu for this evening. We're not going very far for our menu this evening, just the what we call the Cambridge Brew House, which is in that direction, through the back door. Um, but we'll have the menu, and you can kind of have a look at each of the menu and maybe want to take some choices. Um, I don't know what the next word means. It says world. I can't be introducing the world. It must be you. <laughs> I'm going to introduce you. <laughs> I know we better hurry up. So, uh, the, the gentleman to my left is called Dr. Gareth Reeves. This is what he says about himself, and it is, um, uh, it's typically modest. Uh, Dr. Gareth Reeves is a physicist who has spent most of his career developing and applying remote sensing methods for the polar regions. 
He's been a member of the academic staff at the Stockholder Research Institute for the third of the century, and the fellow Christ Coach, so even longer than that. This is where I thought it was going to be, it's only as well for you, because it's his college. But lots of his work has been in the book, and some of his work has been in one room, and most of his work depends on measuring the colour of things with great accuracy, and understanding how colour can be used diagnostically to understand the Earth's environment. So I was going to couple that out and just say he wrote the book, basically. So uh, it gives me great pleasure to welcome you to kick off the keynotes today. Uh, uh, thank you, Sophie. Um, uh, yes, thank you very much. And yeah, welcome to my college. Um, we've covered, actually, with that introduction, most of what it says on the first slide, so that's helpful. Uh, that gets us started. Uh, the title or the subtitle of my talk uh, is slightly wrong, as subtitles usually are. Um, it's uh, not just electromagnetic radiation that we're going to talk about. Um, remote sensing, otherwise known as Earth observation, uh, uses mainly uses information from satellites, uh, increasingly now other platforms, which I'll talk about um, a, a little bit later, to understand what's happening on the Earth's surface. Uh, remote sensing is meaningfully about 40 or 50 years old as a discipline. Uh, it has utterly transformed geography. Uh, it's made a revolution in geography, uh, in, in whole geography, uh, and it's still doing it. And it's the it's still doing it part that I, I really want to, to pick up in, in this talk. Really. So uh, what we do, um, my colleagues and I at Scott uh, and elsewhere, uh, is we study ice and snow and plants and lakes, um, many things uh, in the Arctic and Antarctic, and in fact not just there, um, also in other cold places of the world. And these are places that are difficult to reach and sometimes dangerous to explore. Uh, and those are reasons why remote sensing, as, as I've defined it there, is something that's um, particularly attractive for us to uh, <coughs> Uh, to explore. So that's why I've had fun in my career developing ways of, of doing this. Uh, as Sophie said in the introduction uh, to me, um, a lot of the way we think about this is essentially thinking about the colour of things. Well, um, I'll broaden the concept of colour in a moment, but it's essentially colour. Uh, so it's analysis to measure something similar to colour, and I want to say something about what colour means. Uh, if we start with our, our own um, sort of fundamental understanding of colour, it's how our eyes respond to the amount of light. Now, most people's eyes, uh, and I'm sure I'm not giving away any um, secret information here, um, most people's eyes detect three different kinds of light, uh, roughly speaking, corresponding to red, green, and blue light. It's not true of everyone. Um, some people, mostly men, uh, only respond to two, sometimes even one, uh, colour of light. Those we call that colour blindness. Uh, some people, invariably women, can respond to four different colours of light. That's very rare, but it does happen. Uh, but most of us respond to three. Uh, and our brain uh, tells us how to understand the mixture of these uh, different kinds of, uh, kinds of light. Um, so, we're used to this idea, we've grown up with it, most of us, uh, the idea that the colour of things gives us important information about what we're looking at. So, let me make that abundantly obvious. Uh, if we ask a question, what colour is the Earth's surface? Well, it isn't by colour, it's different colours in different places. Um, what we're looking at here is a, it's actually not one satellite image, it's a lot of satellite images that have been stitched together. Uh, images that don't have cloud present in them. But the colours are, roughly speaking, true. They've been enhanced, uh, so they're more saturated than they would look from a, an impossible vantage point in space to give this image. Um, but the colours are familiar and understandable. Now, I'm particularly interested, a big part of my research at the moment is the boreal forest. Um, 
you can see the boreal forest in this image, and it's the colour that's telling us that it's there. So I might be interested, I probably wouldn't work at the Scotland Research Institute if I was, uh, but I might be interested in deserts. Um, you can see the deserts in this image as well. Again, it's a colour signal. So there is information there in colour. We know this. This is a very familiar idea. And remote sensing, or a big chunk of remote sensing, expands on that idea. Um, <clears throat> that's the way we sort of intuitively and uh, familiarly think about colour. Uh, this is the way that we more scientifically think about colour. Uh, these are what we call reflecting spectra. So they're graphs. Uh, so how high up on the graph uh, the line is, is telling us how good a thing is at reflecting light of a particular colour. How far along the graph we are, the, the axis length of wavelength, is just telling us about the colour. So uh, I have to not go over there because uh, I'll trip over the cable. But the left hand side of the diagram to which three blue arrows are pointing are the part of the spectrum, as we would say, the electromagnetic spectrum, to which the human eye is sensitive. Blue light, green light, red light. But the spectrum doesn't stop there. Um, I've drawn the graph carrying way beyond that into what we call the infrared part of the spectrum. And then the uh, I mean, put five lines that I've put on the graph are showing how reflective some different materials are, some interesting materials. So I've got some snow in there with that sort of light blue graph, so it's quite reflective in the uh, visible part of the spectrum at the left-hand side of the graph. So it's quite bright, we do that. Uh, when we go into the infrared part, the part our eyes can't see, snow actually becomes much less reflective. It's actually quite dark material um, in the infrared part of the spectrum. Um, I won't talk about all the graphs that are drawn there, but look at the green one. The green one is for something made of leaves. Um, so some plant uh, could be a bit of forest or timber <coughs> or something. It's really quite low reflective uh, in the visible part of the spectrum, they're not very bright, uh, I mean, they're not very uh, bright in light. Um, we expect that because they actually absorb light, that's how they make their living. Uh, but they're a little bit brighter in the green part of the spectrum than the other part, so they look green to us. But once we go into the infrared, they become massively brighter. If our eyes responded to infrared radiation, which they don't, um, we would be dazzled by the light that's reflected from, from things in leaves on. So these kind of different curves are characteristic of different materials, and that's the fundamental idea of remote sensing, that we can recognize these, these spectra, these fingerprints of different materials, and say, ah, from the details of that color, I know I'm looking at a spruce tree or some tundra vegetation of a particular kind, or the Sahara Desert, or whatever it might be. So we're fundamentally interested in measuring this, and we can measure these things essentially two ways. We can measure them remotely, using remote sensing, uh, and we can measure them up close, in situ, in the field, and we connect these two pieces of information. Now, the other important thing that's on this graph is the vertical bands with numbers on them. So you can see, out of order, three, four, one, two, five, six, seven. Those are the particular ranges of wavelengths, the particular colours, to which a certain satellite instrument, it's called MODIS, um, I have written that word down, yes, is sensitive. So you can see, I actually coloured them blue, green and red, there are three channels of information connected by the MODIS instrument that correspond pretty much to the sensitivity of the human eye. And that means a MODIS satellite image can make an image in what we call true and actually, that's what we were looking at in the previous slide. Um, if I just jump back to it, I I can. yes, I can. Um, the reason I was able to make this slide, well, actually, I know it was made by the Japanese Aerospace Agency, um, is because the MODIS instrument responds to the same colours that the human eye does, but it responds to a lot more as well. So. Um, here is some multispectral imagery from MODIS. Uh, this is uh, from 
uh, about this time of year, but a few years ago. Uh, this is a strip of imagery collected by the satellite. Uh, what is it? February the 11th and 12th from uh, west of Europe. It is in true colour. It's using, you can see actually at the very top of the screen there, 143 in brackets, those are the channels of information that we use to make that image. So that's how that bit of the Earth looked on that occasion. Here is the same image, but using a different combination of bands, 6 by 4. These are mostly infrared bands, so this is not something accessible to the human eye. Uh, but we do have it in our satellite imagery. And the thing you notice, the difference between this image, and I'll flick back to the previous one, um, is there's a lot of white in this image here. This is the true colour image. In the false colour image here, some of that white becomes blue. Um, that's telling us the distinction between snow-covered areas and cloud-covered areas. So we can pick apart snow and cloud, uh, which to our feeble human eyes all the white by using these extra windows. So um, this is starting to make the case for multispectral imagery. Here's another multispectral image example. Uh, on the left we have a not true colour anymore. This is a false colour infrared representation of the image. It's a little bit of Svalbard. Uh, <coughs> it's around uh, longer here in fact. Uh, that's in the centre of the image. But the choice of bands, spectral bands that's been used in this image, which has come from a different satellite, uh, an instrument called Sentinel 2, uh, is such that if you see red areas in this image, they're actually highly reflected in infrared. And that's telling us that this is an area with green vegetation in it. So this is a map of vegetation. Now, the thing on the right is derived from the thing on the left by computer processing. This is the, I'll say more about this in a minute, this is the kind of bread and butter business of remote sensing. It's taking the image, the information in the image, satellite image, computer processing it to make decisions about it, to make decisions about what does this represent. So this is using this information from the the graph from the spectral symmetry, it says, okay, what's the graph for this particular pixel in the image? What's it like? I look in my library, I'll say this is most like something with vegetation, I'll colour it green. So that's what's <coughs> happened in the right hand image. That's what we would call a classified image. Okay, so that was one example. Uh, another example, um, finding Antarctic penguins from space. The penguins themselves are a bit small to see in satellite images, though uh, some of the activities after this talk will be about finding really quite small things in images. Uh, but we have a rather cunning way of finding penguins uh, from space imagery, not based on the penguins themselves, but based on, uh, how to say, what they leave behind them. Uh, this is a particular satellite image from a system called Worldview 3, which actually has a very High resolution, the pixels are really quite small, they're small than a meter. And we're looking in true color here. So I've got a couple of arrows pointed here one to a colony of the daily penguins, which is this big dark red um, swatch, and then the lower arrow is pointed to the colony of chinstrap penguins, which is a rather yellowy swatch uh, in the image there. So what's going on there? Um, this is, that was a satellite image from the, I think, 15th of January 2015. This is a photograph taken by me, because that's where I was, uh, on the 14th, oh, essentially on the same date. Uh, there is the colony of Adelian penguins. So you can see the penguins, and you can see they're standing in a sea of redness, which is, of course, guano. Uh, the, so, I spent a few years studying the colour of penguin guano, and I will just show you some slides of um, different colours of penguin guano, because it's quite an exciting thing. Um, but the important principle here is that um, at a certain stage in the breeding cycle, 
the guano of the baby penguins becomes red. It's because of what they're eating. They eat a lot of krill. Uh, krill contains red stuff and that turns the guano red. Um, so we measured this. Um, those graphs that I showed you, those are measuring. Um, and my student and I spent uh, a few months in the field in Antarctica measuring the colour of penguin guano. Uh, the way you do this is to characterise the colour by making, this is what the instrument does for us, as it happens. What does that happen? Uh, do I just... You can make that go away. Good. Um, making, uh, as it happens, 2,000 odd pieces of information. So we represent the colour by 2,000 um, excellent. Thank you. Uh, 2,000 or so measurements. We use an instrument called that. It's an ASD field spec pro spectro uh, and it measures the thing that's in the graph. How much light is being reflected as a function of wavelength. Uh, over quite a big range, it goes all the way from ultraviolet to the infrared. So, very, very detailed spectrum. Um, um, uh, that's all right. Oh, that's all right. So, this is this is this is what it looks like when you do that. That's me uh, with some uh, optical equipment connected to a computer, which is measuring the uh, amount of light in different wavelengths being reflected by. Uh, well, penguins and their guano. Penguins and their guano. Um, and what you get from that is just the kind of graphs that I've shown you before, the spectral reflectance graphs. So here are some. Uh, so that um, blackish graph is what the reflectance spectrum looks like for pink adeli guano. And the red graph is pink ginstrap guano, and there's a yellow gentoo guano there as well. Right, um, so that's where those reflectance spectra come from. Along the bottom of the slide, I've written the names of some physical, well, actually some monitors, um, that are responsible for particular features of these spectra. Uh, so, um, and this is where we get diagnostic with our measurement of, of colour. So we see there is what we would call an absorption feature around 500 nanometers. Uh, in some of these spectra, not all of them, we know that that's caused by the presence of a pigment called astaxanthin, which is the stuff that makes krill, and for that matter, satin pink. Um, there is an absorption feature around 1400 nanometers, that's caused by water, the stuff is wet, and there's an absorption feature in some of these around 2200 nanometers, and that's caused by chitin, and chitin is something that's present in the it's the shell of the krill itself, so that Jose is nodding here, so I'm obviously not talking too much rubbish here. Um, so this is this is coming from the, uh, the crunched up bits of krill that are present in the uh, uh, what comes out of the back end of the penguin. So we can actually recognise these things from the spectral information. So it's it's kind of being diagnostic. Um, that's the most detailed way of saying something about colour. Quite often we then sort of flatten the information again so that we have a more, let's say, everyday way of uh, describing colour. Uh, I'm sure most of us are familiar with the idea of a colour wheel. Uh, that's all this is here. Uh, so we speak of two things on a colour wheel. We speak of hue and saturation. Hue is whether we're talking about red or green or blue or purple or whatever. So that's how far around the circle we go. Saturation is whether we're talking about um, grayscale or pastel or saturated colour. So that's how far out from the centre we are on this diagram here. So this is making colour two-dimensional. It's obviously multi-multi-dimensional really, but this can be a convenient way of sort of flattening the information. So just for fun, I've put not all the things, many of the things that we measured when we were doing our study in Antarctica on this diagram here. So you can see snow, is not very saturated and a little bit on the blue side. Uh, mosses, there aren't mosses on Sydney where we're studying, are quite saturated and on the sort of yellow end of the spectrum. You can see different kinds of uh, guano and indeed vomit. Who says that scientists don't have 
fun doing it. <laughs> so yes, there's penguin vomit, not um, any other kind. Um, so um, coming back to the satellite image, this is my point. You can take these two things. You can take the satellite image. You can take what you can know from the detailed spectrum names and start connecting them. And instead of saying, "Oh, look, there's a red splotch in the image," you can say, "I can detect the presence of astaxanthin and chitin at this point in the image." So that makes me think, "Hmm, penguin uh, must be feeding on krill." Uh, and I can, in another place, I can see chitin and water. I can see something that hasn't been feeding on krill because there's no astaxanthin present in the signal there. Okay, um, now, yes, I got. I just Sorry, uh, briefly, yes. I don't want to lose your flow, but I'm fascinated by what you just said about the worldview satellite. You started by saying it's one meter for a pixel. Yes. Is that correct? Yes. So actually, it's smaller. Like yes. a colony is, could be quite a large yes. area, but is it possible if you had an area of um, guano red color covering just one um, meter squared, would the satellite pick that up? Subject to obviously what what you interpret from the satellite picture. Probably not down at the level of one single pixel, but there aren't colonies that small. So uh, you would need finer resolution images to do that. And how you get finer resolution images, I'm coming to. <laughs> Good question. Thank you. Ian. Yes. Um, so I, I want to make a little. Um, I have to do it quite briefly. Uh, a little um, discursion here. Um, to say something about what's been called the cathedral and the bazaar. This, this is about software. Uh, you'll see the point in a minute. Um, I'm talking about open source software. Um, <coughs> uh, traditional software development, the kind that I grew up with, I mean, I wasn't a software developer, the kind of software that I used when I was growing up, um, has been likened to building a cathedral. Uh, carefully crafted by individual wizards or small bands of mages working in splendid isolation. That's how things like Microsoft Office get written. Um, open source software development uh, is like a great babbling bazaar of different agendas and approaches. A little bit chaotic. That's not my words, those are the words of Eric S. Raymond and also on Wikipedia. Um, I'm talking about the distinction between public domain and open source software as well. Um, free software, public domain software, and open source software are not exactly the same thing. Uh, Eric Raymond's characterization of different development models is too simple, and it's probably becoming less true than it was a few years ago. But public and open source software tends to be reproducible, and transferable for a variety of reasons. The question that scientists, I think I should say, <laughs> will have in their minds about open source software, or free software, publicly available software, is whether it does the job okay, whether it's sufficiently functional. I'm coming to a point. Um, the image processing examples I've showed you so far have all been done with software called Multispec. Um, Multispec is free. It's public domain software. It's actually not open source software. It's only got one developer, uh, but he's very responsible. Matty B is his name. Um, it's multi platform. Well, it's not completely multi platform because it's not available for Linux, but it's on Mac operating system and Windows. It understands technical things to do with where images are located on the Earth's surface. Some of its features are very advanced. Um, it's real image processing software. It's something that would have been unimaginable as free software um, 20 years ago um, when I was starting to need to use image processing software myself. But now it's there. You can get it. You can use it. We have a demonstration for one of the activities um, later this morning to use it. Now. Yes. Now. Now. Right now. We have it here. Exactly. Yes, uh, so I'm going to jump past that. Um, I'm I'm putting this one not because it's polar, but because it demonstrates to me um, some of the extraordinarily advanced features available for this kind of software. This is actually I'm not sure what saying, no, this is actually Portugal. Um, <laughs> this is the Algarve coast, as it happens. On the left, uh, we've got 
one of these false colour infrared images. On the right, we've got, let's just say, something generated by using the spectral signatures, the spectral reflection spectrum signatures of the data in the image. So it's classified the image into many different kinds of manifold. That is the point I'm trying to make here is that is something that is completely within public reach to do. Okay, so um, have I got a few more minutes? I haven't got a few How many more minutes. Five? Yes. I did start that. Go for it. I did yes. Start that. Go for it. Yeah. Um, yes. Um, we talked about scales, and Ian asked, he's not a plant, uh, but he asked a very good question, which is about the scale of things that you can see uh, in images. Um, so we've got stuff we can do really close up. We can make measurements on the ground of colours of things. We've got satellites collecting uh, images in pixels, which can be a few metres or 10 metres or something like that. There's a bit of a gap between the range of scales. We have a new way of filling that gap. It's called um, it's called drones. In popular parlance, it's called drones. So I just want to say a little bit about using drones uh, to collect um, remote sensing data. And I'm showing some examples from uh, work that we're starting to do in uh, North Norway here. So here's two of my Norwegian colleagues um, fixing a slightly broken drone. Um, we're going to do this in and around Tromsø in northern Norway. Um, that's um, Ben and Yala are ready to launch the drone. There's the drone um, taking off. Um, what we're flying is over here is a little bit of birch forest. It's quite autumnal. This is September with a tiny amount of tundra understory. It's um, crowberry um, and petronigrum um, growing beneath the trees. And by flying the drone around, collecting roughly a thousand images from the drone and stitching them together, which we don't personally manually do, that's done in software, we can assemble an image like this. This is uh, an image that couldn't actually be seen from any real vantage point. It's what we call an ortho image. So it's had all the distorted perspective effects taken out by calculation. So everything is looking vertically downwards. And uh, we can see trees and shadows, and I'm just going to zoom in a little bit on part of that there. Uh, you can see, actually, you can see, I can't reach the point, but you can see the operators actually standing just on the left hand side of the car there, um, flying the thing. Uh, here's the same image in false colour infrared. So we can do that same thing of working out how strong or weak the vegetation is. We can do a, a huge number of other things with the spectral information we can collect. We can do something cleverer still, and Tom will say something about this if you go to his activity. So mm -hmm. that's a plug for him. Um, there's even more information in what can be collected from drones. Um, if we have the same piece of surface imaged from lots of different vantage points, which we probably do if we arrange a lot of overlap between the images, we can do the perspective thing. We can essentially do the job that used to be done in old fashioned stereo photography, but in a different way. Um, not by knowing a huge amount about the technical characteristics of the camera, which we probably don't know, or very detailed information about where the camera was located when it required the picture, but just by saying, well, we've got a lot of images, we're going to throw a lot of computer processing power at this and work all that stuff out. It sounds impossible. But it's not, it works. It's called structure from motion, and it's getting to be a big thing now. Um, so here, this is not from the same Norwegian site, this is actually from one of my Russian sites. This is a completely synthetic image. It's not a real thing. It's what we call a dense point cloud. There are lots of colored spots in this image, in all the sky, which is there for our business purposes. Um, there are lots of colored dots here. Every dot has been placed in a position which was calculated from lots of overlapping drone images to be where a reflecting thing was located. A reflecting thing was part of the structural part of the tree. So we can visualize that. So we're actually visualizing the 3D structure of the forest here. And that's pretty cool. 
Um, this is another drone, uh, a sort of somewhat bigger drone. I think this is about the same size as the one that Tom's got, but um, we were as careful with that as Tom has with this. Uh, this is in northern Russia. This drone is launched on a catapult. Uh, it's about to be launched there. Um, this is, I'm going to skip past that one, um, to this one. This is the same idea as... Um, I showed you before with some of the satellite images. This is multispectral imagery, which has been, as we say, classified. So there are, I think, 20 different colors in this image. Each of these colors now represents a different physical thing on the Earth's surface. Um, so I'm winding it up at two last slides. Um, this is really my big point. What is now freely accessible at professional standards? I mean, the standard that you would need to have access to in order to convincingly write a uh, research paper. Um, the answer to this question 20 years ago, 25 years ago, was more or less nothing. What is it now? Um, satellite imagery with spatial resolution, so pixel sizes down to around 10 meters or so, is uh, Landsat imagery, Sentinel imagery, Sentinel, which is the new kid on the block, this is the European um, satellite observing system, uh, is technically absolutely fantastic for data support. Uh, image processing software, so the multi-spec I've been talking about, um, it's not the only one, it's free. Um, I haven't even explained what this means, but the kind of <laughs> geographic information system software that lets you essentially make maps and computers, it's free. Um, High-level computer programming languages uh, like Python, like R, like Octave in the old days, we would have said things like Fort Crown, and MATLAB, and so on. <laughs> it's free. Um, structure for motion software. There's a lot of stuff that isn't free around. It's very not free, a lot of it. But there is starting to be free software as well. There's something called Regard 3D, which we're starting to experiment with. So this is the revolution that's happening now. This stuff is so far in the public domain now that we can all do it. I think the one thing that isn't quite on my list, actually, is the detailed quantitative measurement of color. That has some technical challenges which have not yet been resolved, but we're working on it. And one of the activities that we've got for you this morning, which Praveen is running, and Praveen is here, I've seen them, um, uh, is about the measurement of color. Um, so I'll point to this paper here, which uh, um, several of us, um, two of us are in the room now, um, wrote a few years ago. So the paper's a bit out of date, but um, the point of it isn't. Um, so the paper was about open access data. It's still worth reading, although things have been gone a bit in five years since then. So it's not just about data, it's also about software and things like that. So it very much was written um, from the point of view that I've been trying to take here, that this stuff is available to us. So, last slide. Um, what are the activities that we've got for you now to follow up on the keynote? Um, I've characterised them very simply. I say we've got two of them on finding things in satellite images. So, the so Hannah and Prem are running activities on finding, um, uh, well, uh, whales and seals, respectively, uh, in images. Uh, Tom has got an activity on measuring things in drone images. And Green, as I've already mentioned, has got an activity on measuring colour and could also have something on using this kind of uh, interpersonal software, multi, multi spec, um, to visualise different band combinations. And that, because I've gone over time, is definitely everything I want to say. Perhaps it won't. I can share. I don't know why I need to make it. Um, so, we will, we will break out now. Um, some of you may have got burning questions for Gareth, but we do have a panel discussion and schedule. Um, after the second repeated breakout sessions. So write them down on a piece of paper or commit them to memory now.